Those are the breaks. We've got that first. So you're all very, very welcome. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to hand over shortly to uh, Benedict, uh, sorry, to Mr. Joseph Rook, who's our uh, young professional advisor, who is uh, part of our young uh, leaders program in United Europe. And if anybody in the audience is interested, either as a potential young leader who'd like to join our program or as a potential mentor for, for uh, the leaders program, please do get in touch. Um, I'll hand you over now to uh, Joseph Rook, but before I do, uh, I'm very curious about this event um, in the sense that uh, one talks about the military and uh, cyber warfare and so on, and you might think that this is maybe a bad development if we do our wars in the cyber realm, surely that's going to be uh, less bloodshed, less uh, fatalities, less casualties, but uh, I think that we're going to learn that it may actually not be the case. It's not as benign as, as the name might, um, might lead you to believe. So, so um, without further ado, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, and welcome everybody to uh, what I'm sure is gonna be a fascinating seminar, looking at how militaries use cyber capabilities. Before I introduce our panelists, just a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be time at the end of this call uh, for our panelists to respond to questions. So if you do have any questions throughout the seminar, if you could submit them on the chat, if you could submit your name, your organization uh, that you represent, and then the question, my colleagues will flag these to me at the end and I'll read them out for our panelists to respond to. Can I please also stress uh, to ensure that you're on mute throughout the seminar? So without further ado, now for introductions, I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today by Denis Messier and Benedict Franca. Dennis Messier joined the French Air Force Academy in 1979 and became a certified pilot in 1983. The second part of his staff career was devoted to planning, innovation, transformation, and international affairs, where he developed a wide range of interactions with the United States. In 2010, he became senior military advisor to the Minister of Defense, and in 2012, he was appointed Chief of Staff of the French Air Force. In September 2015, he was appointed Sup uh, Supreme Allied Commander of Transformation in NATO, a position based in Norfolk, USA. He has a total of 3,400 flight hours, 182 of which are spent on combat missions. He is a Grand Officer of the Legion of Honor, an Officer of the National Order of Merit, and has received numerous foreign awards in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and America. Benedict Franke is the Chief Executive Officer of the Munich Security Conference and responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the organization and the strategic development of its formats and activities. Additionally, he serves as the Executive Director of Munich Security Conference Foundation. Benedict has served as a Senior Advisor for, the strate for Strategic Affairs at the headquarters of the Christian Social Union and was part of the inner campaign team for the, uh, for the successful local, state, and federal elections of 2013. Before that, he worked as a special assistant for the former Secretary General of the United Nations and Nobel Laureate Kofi Annan. Benedict Franca holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and a master's degree from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And Benedict also publishes regularly on foreign affairs. So welcome, gentlemen. It's really great to have you both with us uh, this afternoon. So without further ado, let's kick off the seminar and hear from our panelists on this topic. So Dennis, if you're happy to, maybe you can start us off by walking through where this all began. And then Benedict, your additional geopolitical context, knowledge will be extremely insightful as well. So on that note, Dennis, uh, I'd like to invite you to, to share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have this uh, opportunity to address uh, a few of my thoughts regarding uh, this uh, cyber uh, cyber issue, which is uh, becoming uh, both in the military and civilian sector more and more important for our world, uh, and uh, and becoming one of the main threats we will we have to face and will we will have to face in the future. Um, regarding your question, when uh, when did it start? In, in fact, uh, I would like to just mention that uh, I, when I was in NATO in uh, 2016, Warsaw Summit, NATO declared cyber domain as a, a full operational domain, as are the land, maritime, and, uh, and, air, uh, and air domains. Uh, that's, it was very important recognition uh, of the uh, cyber domain uh, used uh, in uh, military operations. 
And at the same time, it was recognized that it was a very important domain that could be shared between NATO and the European Union. However, it, nothing started in 2016. It started much, uh, uh, much uh, 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 further in the past. And uh, 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 if I look at France, um, I, can, uh, I can see the first agency that was created for cyber defense. It was, uh, it was in 1980, uh, 1986, uh, and then it moved uh, uh, 10 years after in 1996 uh, under the responsibility of the prime minister, which is in the French constitution responsible of the uh, protection and the security of, uh, of the country. But uh, we had to wait uh, the uh, uh, white paper for defense and security in 2008 to have it integrated in, uh, let's say, uh, a document that mentions uh, defense and security, and security matters. And at this time in France, it created the National Cyber Agency for, uh, the National Agency for Cyber Security. But this agency is limited to uh, defensive issues. And it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it covers all the ministries, not only the defense issues. Uh, I, I can say that at the same time, France had developed uh, cyber offensive capabilities. But, but did not say it as it was uh, highly classified, as many nations did. And uh, following this uh, recognition at the Warsaw Summit in 2016, now many nations have recognized that they had developed uh, offensive uh, capabilities, uh, but they won't talk a lot about it because uh, the courses of action are very, very classified, but this is at least a recognition that that exists within, few within a few nations. And uh, uh, if, I, if I try to look at, uh, in the past, uh, uh, some significant examples of the use of uh, uh, cyber offensive actions, uh, probably one of the most significant was on uh, September 6, 2007. Uh, it was uh, at this time, Syria was building a nuclear plant, which was assessed by the international community come a, a potential plan to build the future nuclear weapons and, and weapons of, uh, 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 mass destructions, and then at this time, this Israel decided to uh, destroy it, uh, and they used, uh, let's say, F-16s, F-15s, which are uh, aircraft far from being stealth. Um, uh, what what happened during this raid is very interesting, because if you launch a raid with aircraft like this, and you use, you make an extensive use of electronic warfare, you are detected. You will launch a lot of missiles and everything, but no missiles get the target. But but you are detected. Here this time, they have a full raid of aircraft with none of the aircraft detected, and they were not stealth. And there is one reason for that. The reason for that is they use they used a, a, a very important cyber attack that made all the Syrian systems, which are very sophisticated based on Russian systems, absolutely uh, blind. So the pictures of the radar of the radars were absolutely clear, but they were but but it was not true. Uh, there were there were a lot of aircraft in the air, and they destroyed this uh, this factory, and uh, that's that's very impressive. Nobody knows exactly exactly how they injected this virus. Could be through a, a drone. It could be through a, a, a spy uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, inserted uh, in the uh, in the air defense system. I don't know. We don't know. At, at least I don't know. But, but, but the cyber attack is for sure. Um, just a second example is the second uh, Iraqi war where uh, all the uh, Iraqi officers received through the Iraqi defense uh, uh, ministry email system. So the official defense system, all these Iraqi officers they they received emails from the, from the US telling them uh, go home and don't try to fight. We have nothing against you. We are, we are fighting against Saddam Hussein and, uh, and, uh, and stay away from this fight. And many of the Iraqi officers, they, they, they obeyed, uh, in fact. And this was uh, another kind of use of uh, a, a strong cyber attack in support of uh, military operations. Uh, on the Russian side, uh, we know that uh, there were a lot of, uh, of cyber, uh, cyber attacks in Georgia and in Ukraine at the same time that uh, there was the invasion of uh, uh, part of their territories. And uh, at this time, uh, the Russians, they said, uh, this was not them, this was not the country, this were probably groups of nationalists uh, who uh, uh, wanted to support uh, the, uh, what, what happened in the two countries. And, and that, that shows one thing, that shows the difficulty of the attribution, because uh, the international community uh, could not officially, clearly attribute uh, these attacks uh, to Russia. 
And uh, I can tell you that uh, today, and, and this is this is interesting uh, how we can use a cyber the cyber domain domain in uh, uh, in hybrid warfare. Uh, today we are still facing uh, many cyber attacks in Europe, or not only in Europe, in US as well, and everywhere in the world, coming from Crimea. But it's very uh, and 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 the methods are Russian methods. But it's very difficult for the countries to say it coming it's coming from Russians because that would recognize that uh, Crimea is Russian, which is not uh, what the international international committee want to recognize. So so they, they use Crimea because they know that. They know that their attribution will never be uh, to the country, and uh, uh, I, I could I could have uh, yeah many other examples, but uh, that shows that uh, uh, from now quite a long time, uh, cyber uh, has been really uh, in fully integrated in uh, uh, in, mili in military operations. So so that's the past. I don't know if you want uh, Joseph uh, me to continue with today and the future, or maybe we can do that after. But this, I, I wanted to set the scene with, uh, with these examples. Absolutely, and, and really fascinating. And maybe we can touch on a bit more around the attribution side, uh, definitely mm -hmm. as we move on, because I know that's a that's a topic that gets raised a lot. Um, but definitely, let, let's let's carry on. But it, it might be good to bring um, bring yourself in, in Benedict here in terms of um, sort of the, the, the geopolitical elements. We've had some examples there of where this has been used. Um, and and de let's definitely talk in a minute about what we're seeing now and what we're going to see in the future. But maybe this is a chance for yourself to interject here and, and sort of give us a, a bit of an overview of what's happening geopolitically. Um, if you allow, given that we yeah. don't have, have a lot of time left, let me do the following. Let me first of all thank you and James and the rest of United Europe for inviting me. Uh, and second, you know, let me just sort of say it straight from the beginning. I'm not a cyber expert. I'm not even a four-star general. So my role is, is a slightly different one from the one that Dennis has. I, I see my role as a, a challenger, uh, an advocatus diaboli that uh, raises a couple of red flags that get you guys in the seminar thinking and that gets the discussion afterwards going. Um, I'd probably like Dennis to continue and then raise a couple of political flags at the end if that's okay with you, otherwise we'll, we can also do it. Uh, but I see Dennis raising the hand, he's a uh, four-star uh, general, then <laughs> let's do what Dennis says. Absolutely, Dennis, absolutely. Back over to you, please, uh, you know, do walk us through what we're seeing now, it's, it's fascinating, thank you. Um, so, so w yeah, w what is happening now with that? As, uh, um, now cyber is, is recognized as a military domain. I mean, we, we still have the, the two issues, uh, cyber defense and, uh, and, the, uh, and the offensive action. In the, in the, in the cyber, cyber area, what, uh, when, when we analyze uh, what we have to do, uh, we need to look at the different levels. And starting with, the, let's say, the uh, political and the strategic level, one of the big things, as, as we mentioned already, is the attribution. And uh, the attribution is very important. It will never be for sure. So this is a real political decision. And this is why I, I do believe that uh, it should be a good discussion for international organizations such as NATO or the European Union, for instance, uh, because, uh, because uh, you can make many mistakes. And the key question is not uh, whether we had a cyber attack or not. The key question is, what is the target? Uh, is it uh, a key target uh, for one country? And what is the effect on the target? And depending on the target and the effect on the target, the answer could not be a, 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 a cyber answer. The answer could be a, a, a full military operation with kinetic actions, because it's really the effect on the target and, uh, and, uh, and the effect uh, on the target itself and the effect that would trigger uh, the response. Uh, and this is uh, what we have in mind. And NATO has recognized that the Article 5, which is an attack on one, is an attack on all allies, could be triggered by, uh, by, a, cy by a cyber attack. Again, pending, uh, pending on the targets that has been, uh, uh, that has been selected by uh, our opponents. And, that's, that's, and the, the question of attribution, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very important. This is why uh, uh, in NATO, it has been decided not to create, after Warsaw, a specific cyber command but to have an operation center with all the nations connecting to this center and sharing uh, their, uh, their capabilities, which is very interesting because we have demonstrated that uh, if we connect many nations working in different ways, you have 
more uh, 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 probability to detect and then more probability to uh, react and more probability to have a good attribution. Uh, and again, at the end, the attribution will be a political decision. Uh, and this attribution could lead to a, a much deeper operation than only a, a cyber operations. Uh, when I say that, that implies that nations uh, really want to connect their, uh, their systems and they trust each other when they connect their systems and they share data, which is uh, something we need to uh, uh, exercise before. And, uh, uh, and that means that uh, uh, when, when we talk about this, we need to be sure that uh, our head of state and government, they understand the effect and they understand what is the attribution, they understand the technology and they, uh, and they are trained. So when we think about training, individual and collective training, it's not only the soldiers, not only the officers, not only the generals, this is the head of state and government as well, because they will do the attribution. And this, this is a huge political responsibility and they need to understand what is behind that. They need to understand the uncertainty that will be uh, behind this attribution and, uh, and, and the technologies that can be used. And, and finally, uh, today, when we look at the offensive action, uh, again, this is very classified. So um, um, uh, what has been decided in NATO is, uh, there is there will be no military operation now and in the future that will not be supported by, uh, by cyber, cyber operations. But uh, uh, SACUR with, with the operational commander will ask uh, for an effect and one nation will say, I can not take this effect. The nation will deliver the effect, but will never share with the others how they do it. But they will deliver the effect. And, uh, and, and, and you, if, if there is an oper a military operation, you will hear about all the kinetic action and everything. I will probably never hear about the cyber uh, side of it. But, but be sure there will always be a cyber a side of it. And, and that means that from now to the future, what we need to do is to be sure that we have this appropriate training, to be sure that uh, we, uh, we have a sort of code of conduct between uh, all allies, member states, uh, nations who want to work together in order to, uh, uh, to, to share the, what they want to share in order to be sure that uh, uh, when they, they uh, uh, attack uh, some things they try to avoid uh, uh, attacking their own network. Because that's the problem with offensive action that uh, you never know where your uh, cyber attack will go. And uh, it's very difficult in this field uh, you know, with an aircraft, you drop a bomb, you know where the bomb will go. In a cyber attack, you never know exactly. And, uh, and that could be very difficult for everybody. So that's, uh, that's another issue uh, that you need, you need to take into account and understand at the political level when you do it. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of other things to share, but uh, to let uh, just uh, uh, Benedict speak, uh, this, this was the first uh, thing I, I, uh, I wanted to address. Thank you. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting and, and um, it'd be great to touch on some of those points again in a minute. Um, so may, maybe, Benedict, if, if you wanted to come in at this point um, and maybe share any thoughts that you may have on, on, on what, what's being discussed, uh, maybe we can then start bringing in questions shortly after, I'm sure. And, but Dennis, actually, you know, there's probably a lot more to talk about. As you say, we could probably do three of these. <laughs> but Benedict, over, over to yourself if you have anything to add. Perfect, thank you. Yes, um, I'll keep it short, but let me raise a couple of red flags in, in the kind of separation that you recommended to us at the beginning, namely dividing it into the past, the present and the future. Um, on the past, you know, this is not the first revolution in military affairs, and it will not be the last. There are so many famous examples, you know, take HMS Dreadnought, most of us probably know that, um, take the tank, uh, the chariot, uh, bow and arrow, firearms, uh, satellite imagery, um, the 3D printing, there were always people that said that will change the nature of war and that will change the logic of warfare. And it never did. And I think my point is, and it, it speaks to what James said at the beginning, I think people have, have a totally wrong idea of what cyber warfare actually is. It's not clean, it's not nice, it's not harmless, it's as dirty as all other kinds of warfare and it will be as bloody. So I, I think that is a red flag one has to raise right at the beginning. War will remain war. Um, and then, you know, moving to the presence, I think there are also a couple of red flags that people just 
fail to take note of all the time. Uh, Dennis uh, is absolutely right when he when he said, and I, I quickly quote him, the cyber domain is still less resourced, less understood and less mature than other military domains. Totally true. And it begins with the logic of the, the three key aspects of cyber warfare. It's the enabling aspect, uh, improving command and control and interconnectivity. It's the defensive, the protective aspect, and it's the offensive uh, aspect. People confuse them all the time. There is one sort of uh, metaphor that the a former head of the NSA once uh, told me, and I can't get it out of my head, and so I share it with you. In a way, cyber is like the metal in medieval warfare. Not only was the sword of the knight made out of metal, yes, his shield was made out of metal, and everything else around him was made out of metal, and it's what totally changed uh, the, uh, the setup. So cyber is present in every single aspect of, of military warfighting these days, and unfortunately of non-military warfighting these days, and it hence looking at it through the lens of trying to fit it into uh, a pattern or a theory of, of previous uh, warfare is as wrong as it was to try to fit the bow and arrow into present concept. Hence, we need to, we need to rethink um, military doctrine uh, in, in that area. Because for example, deterrence does not really work at the moment because, and I'm coming to another red flag, the West um, is, is falling back against the East. Yes, we have wonderful uh, technology companies, we have a lot of money, but we don't have the political will and we don't have the, uh, the freedom of rules and regulations to compete with our opponents at the same level. The Chinese and the Russian players can use cyber in a very different way from us. And even though Dennis is absolutely right that you know, offensive cyber actions are now part of every single offensive military operation that the West does, it is so in a very restrained way. Yes, we can you know, shut off air defenses, or maybe we can send an email to Iraqi soldiers to warn them of impending airstrikes and demotivate them. But we are never gonna cut off uh, the electric grid or switch off hospitals uh, or put pressure on the civilian population in a way that both the Russians and the Chinese uh, might, might be ready to do. So um, the point is we, we definitely have to look at the, the truth. And the truth here is that at the moment, neither Europe nor many other Western states have the the capacities to, to, to engage in the kind of military operations that so many experts out there assume are already happening. Um, look at the wars that are currently going on. Look at Yemen, look at Libya, look at the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. They were pretty dumb or are pretty dumb wars. And I think that is what we're going to see for the foreseeable future. And it brings me to one of the key red flags on uh, on the presence of uh, cyber warfare, namely that soldiers have always been accused of preparing for the last war, of, for fighting the last war. I think we've come to a situation where our soldiers uh, and, and present company excluded, obviously, um, have fallen prey to preparing for the war after next, but not the next war. Um, we, we expect uh, the next war to be focused on cyber, to be, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I get the feeling that people believe soon we'll run around with lightsabers and, 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 and spaceships. The next war will be dirty. It will be confusing. It will be more like the attack of Russia on, on Crimea uh, and, and less uh, like Star Wars. And my main worry about the present, uh, about the the, the current discussion is that, that we're too far in our discussion. We're too advanced in our discussion and we've lost track of the dirty, hard, where focused uh, current uh, military operations. And let me just mention a couple of things on the future uh, of uh, military cyber warfare. 
I think it's fair to say the future will come, but not just yet. Um, we, we are far behind on, on research and, uh, and development. We still have no clue of the kind of vulnerabilities that we've gotten ourselves into. We've worked very hard on interconnecting our military platforms and we've created huge vulnerabilities in the process. We also have no good answers to some gray rhinos on the road. You know, gray rhinos are a bit different from black swans, gray rhinos you see coming a mile away uh, and the impact really does hurt. Take quantum computing. I think we should talk about that. Uh, a lot of the, the sort of defensive cyber measures that are currently in place, and I'm sure Dennis can, can speak to the details, are totally, totally dependent on the assumption that the West will remain in the lead when it comes to quantum technology and will fall apart at the moment that the bad guys uh, have the first mover advantage. Um, you know, what, what kind of warfare will we see in the future? Will we see uh, a cyber 9-11? So, uh, you know, a one shot event uh, with dramatic consequences? Will we see a, a cyber Pearl Harbor where one military destroys another military with cyber means? Will we see a cyber Vietnam where things, you know, drag on and drag on and drag on? And I think we have absolutely no idea. And hence, I would always temper a detailed, um, highly theoretical discussion uh, about military cyber operations with the, the common sense of military um, risk management and strategic foresight. It will be an important part of our wars to come, but it is certainly not, at least that's our view at the Munich Security Conference, uh, a military revolution unlike any other. It's just like all the other military revolutions that we've seen, it will change bits and pieces. But if, as I've said, War will remain war and warfare will remain warfare for at least the foreseeable future. Over to you, Joseph, again. That's that's fantastic. And just and just to highlight some key points that are being raised, and we, you know, we could have endless seminars on these, you know, the, the idea of attribution, the idea of deterrence, how we cooperate, uh, tax on critical national infrastructure, uh, new actors, as we're seeing new actors emerge and, and delve into this space. Um, hybrid warfare, you know, these are fantastic points and, and you know, really grateful you've raised them. Um, I'm already starting to see questions and, and hands being raised. So uh, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate that. But on that point, you know, Dennis, actually, you know, Dennis, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to, to add to that. And um, and then maybe after this, I can start to take some questions. Yeah, yeah if I may, ju just one point uh, uh, I haven't raised. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, what Benedict said that... Uh, 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 Put that, uh, put that on the table. That uh, um, there, there is one thing that uh, that uh, cyber brings, uh, which is very different from the other domains. This is the fact that uh, um, you know one of the one of the issue is uh, to uh, clearly, if we can, uh, define uh, what is peace, uh, war, and crisis. And uh, on the uh, let's say traditional domain, we can have a quite a clear separation. Uh, on uh, what is uh, what is peace and and, uh, and war, but uh, in the hybrid domain we are already in a permanent crisis. So we are not in peace. That's very important because when we talk about defensive actions, even forget about offensive action, defensive actions. When you are not in peace, you normally have the right to implement rules of engagement. What does that mean? Rules of engagement for the cyber issue. It's another key uh, political uh, uh, question. But because we are in a permanent crisis. We uh, self-defense is not is not is not the course the only course of action. We could have rule, uh, rules of engagement, and and again it has to be discussed within many nations, probably in multinational organizations. But we are not in peace in the cyber domain, which makes it very particular. And I'm I'm not sure we have really investigated this uh, uh, within our nations. We react as if we were in peace. We are not. Absolutely, and it is—it is, as I say in English, such a murky, 
murky environment, such a murky world. And, and, uh, and you know, I think that there's, there's possibly lots to come in this development. Um, but I think some fascinating points that have been raised that just to summarize this, this idea that we are very in a nascent stage of this, uh, this is developing and, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this, you know, could be deployed in a, in a conflict moving forward, but it will differ. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and just before I um, start taking questions, uh, Benedict, was there anything you wanted to, to add to that? No, I, I hope I was controversial enough to raise many questions, which I'm happy to answer if there are any. <laughs> Excellent. OK, well, look, I, I've got a question in the chat and I've actually noticed, you know, there's we, we, we can raise hands in here. So, Professor, I will ask you in a minute to, uh, to actually ask your question. So, so I'll hand over to you. But uh, before I do that, I just want to read out this question. Um, from from uh, Valon, I hope I pronounced that correct, member of United Europe. Um, so what about the uh, the influence of uh, the abuse of cybersecurity and democracy, in particular China and Russia? So how are these countries, for example, attacking democracies? Uh, and, um, you know, what is the what is the risk and the threat there? So we're talking more now sort of the political election side of things and, and what are your opinions on that uh, i don't know if, if one of you wanted to take that question I, i'm keen to take it but yes. uh, <laughs> you know i think the the really interesting thing about the the use of cyber tools by actors like russia and china is that they themselves would be the most susceptible to succumb to the effects of these weapons if the West ever decided to use them. Um, this is exactly the kind of tilted playing field that I mentioned before. We have our democratic system, our uh, democratic processes have a soft underbelly. And that is a population that cannot control the quality of information um, as, as well as it should. And by abusing this vulnerability, uh, both Russia and China have hurt us badly over the last couple of years. I do believe, however, that the shot has backfired to a certain extent. Yes, we see them enabling the fringes. We see them driving radicalization. We see them pushing uh, political parties to do things that are not necessarily good for the, the country in question or the alliance. Um, but in the process, inadvertently, I believe they have started to strengthen our democratic system. We, we see a, a ever growing bit of the population checking the quality of the information they consume, getting aware of information bubbles and information silos and reaching out. And, and we see uh, the media, you know, conquering back some of uh, the, the high ground, uh, you know, newspapers and, and, and even things like Twitter were about to die before Trump and, and sort of, you know, polemic politics came back. The interest in politics is, is rising again. And so, yes, it, it's so easy to say our democracies are under attack and it is so easy to, to cry for help. Um, too often, I think two things are left out, namely, if we ever were to turn around and use their tactics and their strategies against them, both Russia and China would be in enormous trouble and they know it. And by having, I would say, done it too long, too openly, they have inadvertently strengthened the very thing they wanted to destroy. That would be my view. Yeah, uh, one of the question, it will never be cyber itself. and. Uh, uh, because I think what is behind the question is uh, the attack on the uh, the voting systems, which is which is which, which is a true issue, which uh, which uh, goes back to the reliability of the data we have. But uh, but that shows one thing: that uh, uh, that cyber, uh, whether it is uh, uh, associated with full military operations or or, or, or the kind of uh, security operations, let's say, uh, it, it, it will. It will very seldom be only cyber without something uh, something else. And uh, what I see is a huge association of cyber with disinformation. And uh, and it's, it's if you associate both of them, 
it's it could be very very effective and uh, and this is why uh, we uh, we probably have never recognized it. This, this information and what we call the information environment as a full operational domain but i think it is one and maybe cyber is just a subset of it absolutely and just you know to say that the disinformation element and how that blends into uh, cyber operations and military operations is is definitely an emerging one uh, and again probably a, a whole seminar in itself but uh, thank you that's really really interesting um professor i see you've raised your hand maybe if, if you uh, if you would like to unmute yourself and obviously ask your question we'll take it uh thank you i might be ah it works to take it down again uh i would uh, i would not completely subscribe to a couple of points uh, that uh, benedict franke mentioned um and if i understood it right it was his interest that somebody uh, that does that um I'm coming from Potsdam, so in fact, I'm uh, uh, here, sitting here, 400 meters away from the Marble Palace, where this book was finished uh, by the wife of uh, Karl von Clausewitz, Marie Gräfin Brühl. And uh, uh, when we saw uh, when we saw Air Force coming into the game around First World War. Uh, we noticed that uh, almost nothing that Clausewitz wrote uh, uh, proved to be wrong. Just we got a new dimension which was not included. And then uh, came in an Italian general, Duha, who uh, uh, introduced strategic air war. If we look at uh, digitalization, or as in the military space, you would call it uh, cyber security, cyber war, all that stuff, um, then we might simply see a new dimension adding. So Clausewitz, let's say two dimensional, uh, then third dimension is air war. And now we have a fourth dimension, which is, uh, uh, which is cyber. And then it all comes down for me, at least, uh, uh, it's long that I left the military, um, but uh, it reminds me in what I learned in the uh, late 80s uh, uh, in my basic training. And they warned us about, uh, I, it's uh, hard for me to translate that into English. In German, it's called uh, Spionage, Sabotage und Zersetzung. So it's uh, uh, Espionage, sabotage, and sedition, I think, might be the right word, if somebody could correct me. And at the end, that's what the uh, digitalization dimension is adding. Uh, it's exact, it exactly comes down to these three points. It's just you no longer send uh, communist teachers uh, behind uh, uh, your enemy's lines uh, 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 blowing up power plants, but uh, uh, you uh, attack his IT systems, and then uh, we see that uh, uh, many of the vulnerabilities that we have are not military vulnerabilities, but civilian vulnerabilities. Brackets, exactly what we saw with Duha, uh, with strategic air bombing of cities. Uh, we uh, had most of the targets in World War II uh, um, uh, then, then the really new strategic impact uh, was on uh, was on civilians and on industry, and that's what we might see here too, um, because it's much easier uh, to turn power off in uh, your enemy's country than to attack military units. And the third thing I would like to add is uh, I'm a professor in digitalization. And uh, I don't see so many differences between uh, warfare and the effect of the digital dimension on warfare than uh, the effect of the digital dimension on industry and uh, on society. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, so I didn't Dennis really ask a question, but uh, <laughs> I think there might be uh, something to answer anyway. 
Benedict or, or Dennis, did, did you have any comments? Uh, for... uh, uh, what, I agree with what you just said at the end that uh, uh, there is no difference between uh, the digital dimension in the, uh, let's say, military world and uh, in the civilian world. Uh, I belong now to uh, an industry and I see that, that the challenges are the same. But the challenges are, uh, are, uh, are really, if we take a real trans digital transformation, really challenging the way we conduct warfare. It's probably war is a war, but but the way we conduct warfare could be very very different. And and one of the things today, what we see is uh, the future. Uh, uh, whether we like it or not, this is this is where we go. The future of our military capabilities will be Internet of the Things. The ships, the aircraft, the soldiers themselves, they are uh, uh, connected objects, which means that the real uh, uh, military capacity is the co command and control system that connects them. Uh, and that goes back to the cyber issue. Uh, are we creating, as Benedict uh, just said, uh, more vulnerabilities? Yes and no. Yes, if we do not take this cyber issue by design from the very beginning of this network that uh, military network systems that we're creating. If we take that, if we take them from the very beginning by design, then we can uh, probably minimize the vulnerabilities. One of the problems we have today is we have legacy systems and we connect them, but those systems have never, never been created, never been designed uh, to uh, to be cyber protected, which which is a huge problem. For the future capabilities, if you do the, the, the job correctly, then we will anticipate that. And that goes back to what Benedict said about quantum computing. Quantum computing will absolutely disrupt all the uh, crypto keys uh, that, that, that we know today. I know that, uh, that one of the big keys that we know today is that uh, require with the best computers we have in the world 400 years uh, to, be, uh, to be cracked. It will, it will be less than 10 minutes and sometimes it will be a few seconds. And these quantum, uh, these quantum computers are progressing very, very quickly. But today, uh, and I, 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 there are a lot of competition in the world uh, with start, especially startups, uh, with guys who are able to uh, design crypto keys which are resistant to uh, quantum computers. And the, uh, and, the, and the US side, as there is a competition, and they said that within 2024, no more uh, crypto will be develop, developed without uh, post-quantum uh, uh, crypto keys. And uh, I recently went to the Ministry of Defense in France, as they probably will say the same. So that means that in this technology, we need to anticipate. If we do not, if we do not anticipate, we'll be in a huge trouble, huge trouble. But we can anticipate. And Joseph, if, if I may, um, I, I do believe there is a question in there, uh, in what you've said, Professor. I guess the question is, is there a cyber equivalence to the strategic air power question of whether the West at some point will be prepared to cause or to accept hundreds of thousands of casualties uh, in order to achieve, and that's Clausewitz, uh, a political end? I just want also, to, to bring it to one point is uh, the one who is using the break is going to lose. Yes, I mean, but but for me, I think that the key question and, and that's us my... uh, in the new kind of warfare, if I uh, uh, understand you right, might be true. I, I yeah, I think it's true, but I also think um, the question must be asked whether the the European countries or the West per se will ever in future be ready again to commit civilian casualties to achieve uh, a military aim or a political aim at the end. I just want to you know, draw your attention to the ridiculous discussion we're currently having in Germany on the armament of drones. You know, If that's the kind of discussion we are having, can you imagine that it would be politically feasible in the foreseeable future that the federal government would approve a cyber operation or would even be part of a cyber operation as part of NATO or the European Union that would cause massive civilian casualties by, I don't know, switching off the cooling system of a nuclear power plant in China or by, you know, committing things that in one way or the other um, are comparable to the strategic air power that, uh, that you rightly mentioned. M my point is, I don't know. 
and you don't know, but I think we have to have the discussion uh, because if there is a doubt in our mind that that is something that we see as possible, then we need to change doctrine. Then we need to beat uh, our opponents, not on that field, but on another. Um, and, and I don't see enough of that discussion was my point, which, which I hope you can relate to. At, at the end, uh, uh, Germany uh, might be the worst example we could find. Maybe we should not discuss it uh, uh, at the case of Germany, because what's, what's happening here uh, in the last couple of years is, uh, uh, is really, let's say, special. Um, but uh, what you say, that we need to have the discussion and all that stuff, perfectly relates to what I see in industry. They don't do it as well. If you're looking at banks, they, they are not really discussing the impact of digitalization on a strategic level. And uh, we learned in the beginning of the 1990s, um, there uh, everybody uh, had this saying, uh, you can see the impact of IT everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And then Professor. there was this, this famous study management in the 1990s from MIT. And we learned that only if you have new processes, if you do business process re-engineering with IT in mind, then you could uh, exploit IT to the full and you could defend against somebody attacking you on this new domain. And I would guess, uh, or I would even uh, think that this is pretty much the same in the military. Professor, thank you. I, I apologize. I have to interject there just because we have so many questions and we're already uh, out of the time. Thank you. Look, I think some well, really we're great only points. six if I see it right. Or are there millions out there that are the, not in the picture? There are many others. <laughs> <laughs> but you raise a fantastic point and, and, and thank you. And look, look, we'll hope to have some more of these. I know we're at um, half past. Um, if it's okay with you, gentlemen, maybe we can maybe carry on this for five more minutes just because there are lots and lots of questions. So um, I, I, I'd love to, to get through as many as possible. Um, so just uh, very, very briefly, uh, if we can maybe cover the recent SolarWinds incident. Now, just very briefly, for those who don't know what SolarWinds was and the supply chain attack, uh, this was widely believed to be uh, a breach on a software company by Russian, uh, Russian actors, uh, which led to uh, the compromise of, of many sensitive networks. So really the question here that, the, that we have is around supply chain attack. And, and how this could be um, militarized, how this could be used, not just for the Mitch, but for espionage. So um, maybe, maybe Dennis or, or Benedict, I mean, a couple of questions here. So the threat from supply chain attack, and then also kind of back to this attribution piece, because it's very tricky to say, well, who did that? So maybe, uh, Dennis, I saw you came off mute there. I don't know if you, you had a, a thought on that, that recent supply chain attack. Uh, yeah, f f first of all, and uh, I, I think that uh, on this kind of attack, uh, we know that uh, as prob probably the, uh, the, the attack uh, has been here for uh, yeah, months, years, and, uh, and this, this is a kind of attack that can be activated wherever, wherever the nation wants. And that's, uh, that, that's one of the problems is uh, we, we may have a lot of potential attacks in the future on many infrastructures, but, but, but they, are, they are just quiet uh, and uh, and they can be reactivated very quickly uh, uh, again this is what I mentioned at the beginning it's, uh, it's uh, we need to to look very carefully at the uh, uh, the, uh, the the target and the effect on the target and this is all of the first nations and 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 all nations together to say uh, this uh, this has uh, gone through a threshold that could lead to uh, other response, uh, responses. And those, these other responses could be uh, military action, but it could be sanctions. It could be a lot of things, providing that we have the right attribution and that goes back to the attribution. But, uh, uh, and, and, th and this is why uh, uh, th this debate should be a bit anticipated, I think, uh, with what could, be, uh, what could be the answers? Uh, what, could be, uh, what could be the kind of threshold uh, that could lead to uh, answers that are uh, not uh, uh, limited to cyber issue. 
And uh, it's, it's quite difficult to do, the, to do that generically. And this is why I do encourage uh, to have, uh, to use the multinational organizations to create exercises and uh, exercises with, uh, with real events, vignettes, in order to train the head of state and government and all the chain of command. Uh, because if we do that generically, then you, you will have generic, uh, generic discussions. If you do that through use cases, uh, real use cases, and say, if this happens, what can we do? And, uh, and, and, then, and then that will ease uh, probably the reaction when uh, something real like this happens. Uh, and, uh, and, and for the attribution, there is no other issue than putting, putting many nations together and, and try to share the information and after that, it will be, let's say, the best estimate. Uh, and according to that, there is a, will be a level of probability. And then you, you can decide uh, uh, what is the reaction. But uh, I, uh, I, 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 I'm a strong defender of multinational organization because it cannot be done uh, with only one nation, I believe, especially if, it's, if, it's, if it is a nation that has been uh, under attack. Uh, I mean, this requires many nations together. Uh, and and I, this this is a key issue for me for me for the multinational organisations. Thank thank you and 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 Benedict, it would just be very uh, great to you know, get an idea of where where do you approach this? How, how how do you deal with a supply chain attack which is believed to be a nation state, and and how would you approach this um, multilaterally? What are, what are your thoughts on on the whole issue? I think you know that's in 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 retrospect that's probably one of the red flags I should have used that. In, in cyber, even more so than in most other military domains, there is a strong private aspect. It's private companies that provide software and, and databases and all these things. And hence, we have to have a totally different kind of vulnerability management here, because these are mostly smaller companies, relatively new companies, companies that haven't gone through the endless rounds of vettings that we put our you know tank producers and aircraft producers through and hence as i've said a totally new ball game and a totally new uh, plethora of potential vulnerabilities and i think at least for the foreseeable future i do not see a way for the military to get out of the privatization trap of the recent past and they will not be able to, um, you know, take over many of the, the functionalities that the private sector offers, because Dennis mentioned that they cannot pay as well, they cannot promote as quickly, uh, quite often they're just not as sexy an employer as, as the, the small startups in San Francisco and, and Tel Aviv, and hence, um, I think there is a, a short term problem that is reducing vulnerabilities, a, a mid term issue, namely fragment these vulnerabilities, make sure that unlike in the solar winds case, uh, one company or one supply chain isn't interlinked with absolutely everything else. That obviously was quite a smart place of attack. And then there is a long-term strategy and that is increase domestic capabilities. And I, I, I don't mean you know domestic in the case of a, a nation state, but within the military, we need our own developers. We need our own R&D. And we must reduce dependency on, on third parties that we cannot um, secure or enforce uh, security guarantees as much as, as we've learned to do in, with Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and all the other big players. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that, that's, again, a fantastic point is, is the privatization and how do you secure that? Um, so thank you. Uh, there are many more questions, and I, I really wish I could get through them all. Um, but I'm, I appreciate we are we are over time, and uh, and you know it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, we'd love to maybe consider doing another one of these. I think this is a fantastic topic that people are clearly very interested about, and there's still so much to discuss. So, on that note, uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining. And thank you very, very much as well to our panelists, uh, Dennis Mercier and uh, Benedict Franke. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really insightful and we hope to speak with you all again. And James, I'll pass back over to you to close. That's fine. If you've done a job of closing, I think that's it for today. Uh, we will have uh, updates on Twitter and, and social media and perhaps even on our own website. And watch out for the next edition of uh, this type of event. Thank you everybody for coming.
Thank you. Mm -hmm.